This teaching is going to be on know them by their fruits. Christians, we have fruits. And we're going to learn what the fruits are or what the fruit is. Right here in this chapter, uh, in John chapter 15, Jesus is speaking to the 11 disciples. Because Judas has already done his thing, so now there's just 11. And this is the night that he's to be betrayed. This is the night they arrest him. But before he goes, we're going to see that in John chapter 15, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And it says, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Meaning the gardener. Jesus is the vine, and the husbandman is the father. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. This is a verse that religions use to show you can lose your salvation. Because it says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So it sounds like if you're not bearing fruit, the Lord's going to take you away. That's what it sounds like. We're going to see that the word branch and these, this verse right here it has two meanings. The first branch and the second branch are two different branches. And we're going to see that. The first one in this verse means, and I'm going to read Acts 17.29 to show you. For as much then as we are all the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art of man's devices. Now the word offspring, the first word of offspring means in Greek race. It just means race. This is referring to the creation of God when he made man in his own likeness. In Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them so man is God's offspring just man human not Christians we're just talking about man he created us in his image we're his offspring it also says we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's devices meaning we were made in his image and man shouldn't make a statue of him because we were made like him we should make a statue of him and worship him because, like I've said before, we don't even know what God looks like. So how we can make a statue of him? He says not to do it. And if you notice that in Acts 17, it doesn't use, well, we just read verse 29, but if you read Acts 17, he doesn't use the word father or anything that concerns fatherhood or sonship when you're reading that verse because he's just talking about mankind. He's not talking to Christians, like I said. So, so he's meaning mankind that, that don't have a relationship with him. He's just talking about mankind. So that's the branch here. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he's talking about mankind, not Christians. And I'm going to point that out more. This shows that in the biblical sense, we are all offsprings of God. All of us. This is a, a physical birth. So for God, for us to become spiritually with him, his child, then we gotta get born again. But right now we're all his offspring, even even we were, but now we have a relationship with him. Lost branches, lost mankind does not have a relationship with the Lord. But this is the branch I'm trying to show you that branch and the verse the first word, every branch, that he's just talking about mankind here, his offspring. So what verse two is saying that the word branch, meaning every man which he created doesn't bear fruit, will not make it. We'll see what that fruit is later. We'll talk about the fruit later. This is just an introduction to what I'm going to be teaching on, okay? I don't even know if we're going to get to the fruit. <laughs> but this is this is what we're, we're going to be talking about. So the lost person can't even bear fruit. The second word, branch, in verse 2 means Christians. And and every branch that beareth fruit, he purge it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So he's talking about, now this branch, he's talking about born again Christians. So the two branches here mean have two different meanings. They're not the same meaning. 
And we go to verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Speaking about the Christians. Verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. And who's the vine? Jesus. No more can ye except ye abide in me. The word ye is, like I said, meaning Christians. Unless we're in him, we can't bear fruit. The the lost branch that we talked about, they can't bear fruit because they're not they're not Christians. But same thing for the Christians. We can't bear fruit if we're not you know, there's Christians who don't and I say Christians, but they're so weak and they're so dependent on religion to make it, they're not bearing fruit either. Because he says we got to be in him and he's got to be in us. He's in us, but how many Christians, and there's many, don't use the power of the Lord that's in them. They don't use the Lord that's in them. They still go through life depending on self. And these are born again Christians. They have truly given their heart to the Lord. They have truly given their life to the Lord. They're not really walking with them. Because they don't know how. They don't know how to walk with the Lord. But they are Christians. And he says, unless you're walking with me, you can't bear fruit either. Just like that lost person. You can't bear fruit just like the lost person. Because you're not in the Word. How many Christians study the Word of God continually? <coughs> I mean, I'm talking about continually. Whether it be every night, every morning, every other day, or even maybe just a couple of times a week. How many, I mean, how, how many Christians even do that? I mean, I hate to say it, but most Christians don't even read their Bible. They go to church, listen to the preacher or the teacher, and that's it. So how are they going to bear fruit when they don't even know what the Word of God is saying? So he says, you can't bear fruit, just like the lost. Verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, those of us who live in him, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. When we're walking with the Lord, we bring much fruit. When we're walking with the Lord, I just explained to you, walking with the Lord is in His Word. You've got to be in His Word to walk with Him. You have to be. You cannot walk with the Lord if you don't know who He is. Now this is one that many Christians don't like. They don't like it when He says, we can do nothing without the Lord. There are a lot of Christians out there who, they, they're prideful. They think because they've done this or that, they're, that they've done something. But God says, the Lord says right here, this is the Word of God, without me you can do nothing. Now I'm mainly talking about Christians who are very well educated. You know, Christians that are well educated, they, they are very prideful in that. They really are, I've seen it. They're prideful in that. People who are well off, Christians who are well off, it's either because their parents or maybe they got a good job. But because they're like this, pride. Pride that people who have who who have a lot, they don't depend that much on the Lord because they think they've done it. Now some of them might say, you know, because of the Lord I have this and that, and that's good and that's the way it should be. But you got Christian Christians who really believe they've gotten themselves this. Pride is a very sinful thing. Their accomplishments, uh, their accomplishments they, they think they've done it. You know, I've done this and I've done that. Right here, I'm going to say it again. Listen to me. Don't listen to me. Listen to the Word of God. God says, For without me, ye can do nothing. So all this pride you might have because you've done this or you've done that, right here God says, You've done nothing. You cannot walk with the Lord if you think you're something. Let's just put it that way. If you think you're something, you can't walk with the Lord. Because to walk with the Lord, we have to be very, totally humbled to Him. That's how we walk with the Lord. We're very humbled to Him, knowing we know this verse. We cannot do nothing. That's why we're very humble to the Lord. And we bow down to Him and we listen to His words. Lost people can accomplish things. They can accomplish things and have things. But it's only temporary. It's only temporary. Things that we do down here, that we accomplish because of the Lord, the Lord's going to reward us for that. Now, I'm not saying 
the things that we have, He's rewarded us because either we have a close walk with Him or we've, you know, we've done things to please Him. So that's why we have what we have. But the lost people, if they're doing it on their own, that, that stuff they've accomplished means nothing. The Lord plainly tells us in Zechariah 4, 6, the Lord says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It's not by our might, it's not, it's not by our power, it's by the spirit that we can accomplish things. By the spirit, he says it right here. It's not our might, it's not our power, it's by his spirit we can do things. Now in verse 6, back to John. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into fire, and they are burned. Again, he is saying, if you are a lost branch, you will be cast into hell. That's what it's saying right here. Into the fire, and you will burn. And that's what hell is. If a man does not abide in me, and we already know that. If a lost person is not in the Lord, and the Lord's not in him, we know where they're going. Hell is for real. Right. It says it right here. Verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. He says, He will answer your prayers, if you abide in him. You know, you have Christians who are not walking with the Lord, and they pray, but the Lord doesn't hear you got to be walking with the Lord for Him to hear your prayer. You have to. It says it throughout the Bible. Answer prayer only comes to those whose lives are controlled by the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, then you can pray for yourself, for your family, for whoever. And God hears you. And that's why I like to stay as close as I can in walking with the Lord. So I can pray for my daughter who is lost. So He can hear me how, please Lord, you know. Protect her until she opens her eyes. Because he's not going to make her come to him. But at least I can pray that he will watch over her until her eyes are open. Which I pray that happens. In Psalms 34, 4, it says, I sought the Lord and he heard me. I sought the Lord. What sought the Lord? I was looking for God's will. I was looking for his ways to walk. And when I did that, it says right here, and he heard me. So when you're seeking the Lord, He hears you. Because you're seeking Him. You're looking to grow. So He hears you. Believe me, prayer is very powerful to a born-again Christian who's walking with the Lord. Who's seeking the Lord. I know. I know that it's true. That's why, that's not the reason, but that's one of the reasons I want to have a close walk with the Lord. Because if I have to pray for someone, I want to make sure God hears me. And the only way He's going to hear me is if I'm walking with Him. If I'm seeking him. Now let's look at another one. In John chapter 16. Jesus is telling them how he has to go away. And he knew that they wanted to ask him about that. And he tells them. When that day comes. When they're together again. They won't have any questions. In, in John chapter 16. It, it talks about that. And in verse 23 it says. In that day. You shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. First, we need to know what day is he speaking about. He says, in that day. So when you read that verse, before we go any further, we need to see, well, what day is he talking about? In that day. Well, in verse 17, further up, he says, you won't see me for a little while. When he uh, died on the cross, then he went to go be with him. Well, first he went to... To, to paradise and then he went to be with the father he says you're not going to see me for a little while but then he says but then you're going to see me because as you know after the resurrection he came back and and he was here for a little, a little while with the disciples and he, and he says you will see me again and when then he says you don't have to ask the Lord anything because they'll understand why he left you know when he first left and you look at the shows and they're they're pretty good but they were all scared they didn't know what to do you know he left he's gone they forgot all what he said about him coming back and so they were they were scared but when he did come back then they saw what he was talking about and that's why he said you won't ask you won't have to ask me any questions because then you'll understand what I told you 
Now after their understanding, now they know they can go to the Father. Now they know they can go to the Father and ask anything. In the name of Jesus. That's what it says. In His name. Because now He's resurrected. Now we can use... Before when Jesus was here, you didn't pray in the name of Jesus because He was still here. He was a man. But when He resurrected, went to be with the Father, now He's the Holy Spirit. So now we pray in His name. Meaning if they still need understanding... If they still need understanding of what all was going on, he said, you can ask the Father anything in my name, and he'll show you. Now, of course, if you're one of the ones who claim, name it and claim it, because of a verse like that, you know, how many people use that? The Lord says, ask anything. Yeah. Well, people, religious, religious people, that's what they do, but apparently they didn't read chapter 14 and chapter 15. They didn't read it because it's talking about going to the Father and asking them about the night before his death. You know, because this we're talking about John 15, the night before his death, when he was arrested. So he 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 knew there was going to be questions, but he knew those questions would be gone when he came back. But they might have some that still has questions, and that's why he said, "If you if you ask anything, I'll let you know." If there's something you don't understand, I'll let you know. Please understand. That's what that verse is meaning. It does not mean, oh, hey, I want a new car or a bigger house. I'm just going to ask in the name of Jesus because he's got to give it to me. And believe it or not, there's people who believe that. And let's read John chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. What the Lord is speaking about here is works. He's talking about works in this chapter. So we're talking about works. Well, what was his work? What was Jesus' work? He was doing the Father's will. That's what, what his works was. His work was doing the Father's will, which was healing and witnessing. Performing miracles. This is what the work of, of Jesus was. Doing the Father's will. And he said, greater greater works we're going to do. We're like, that was Jesus. How are we going to do greater works than him? Jesus walked on water. Matthew 14, 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went on to them walking on the sea. So Jesus walked on water. Peter walked on water too. Matthew 14, 29. And he said, come. Peter said, let me come to you. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down... Out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. So Peter walked on water also. Jesus did it. Peter did it. It's right here. It's in the verses. Also, Jesus raised the dead. John 11:43. And when he was thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? Lazarus came forth. Peter did it also in Acts 9:40. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, turning him to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. She was dead and she opened her eyes. So Peter was able to raise the dead also. So when it says greater works than these we're going to do than Jesus, it's the same. we can do the same thing he did. But greater means we're going to do more of it. Because Jesus was just right there in Jerusalem, in Israel. But now Christians are throughout the world. That's why our works are going to be greater because we're now we are we're extended throughout the world. Jesus was just right there in Jerusalem. So greater works, we're going to do the same thing because I'm showing you right here. We can do the same thing Jesus did. Jesus cast out demons, Luke 11:14, and he was casting out a devil and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spoke, and the people wondered. So Jesus cast out the demon, demon from this man. But the disciples did it also in Acts 5.16. There came also a multitude out of the cities around about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick, folk, sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. So just like Jesus did it, man did it. So we can do the same thing, but when it says greater works, like I said, it just means we're going to have a further outreach to do it than what Jesus did. So that's what that verse means up there. Now back to John 14, 
We're going to read verse 13 and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. <coughs> Just as Jesus glorified the Father, that is our will also. Just like Jesus' will was to glorify the Father, that should be our will. Because we're, be, we're supposed to be like, like Christ, right? Like Jesus. Was Jesus asking for a bigger house? More money? Was he asking for stuff like that? No. Jesus was, was wanting to do God's, the Father's will. That's what he wanted. Verse 14. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Oh my gosh. Again. Yeah. I mean, they, these people got more than one or two verses they can go to. Well, it says right here, verse 14. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's what Jesus said. These verses are speaking about the works. If you read the chapter, it's talking about works. It's talking about pleasing the Lord. So that's what we should be asking for. Lord, how can I, what can I, give me what I need to please you. That's what I'm asking for. Verse 7 in chapter 15, it says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will. Put these verses together. And the Lord is saying, if you're walking with me, then your desires are no longer to please yourself. If you're walking with the Lord, your desires are no longer pleasing yourself. Well, give me a bigger house. Give me a bigger car. Give me this. Give me that. No. If you're walking with the Lord, your desires are to please the Father. That's our desires now. It was once to please ourselves. But when we became that new creature, when you got born again... Now those desires are different. When we abide in Him, this is what happens. Ezekiel 36, verses 26-27. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. He's saying He will remove the heart of stone and give us a, a heart that's God, that's God willed. We're going to have a heart that wants to do God's will. He's saying it right here. So when you become a new creature, those desires are no longer what worldly people want. It's no longer self-willed. It's God-willed. Verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. His will becomes our will. Amen? That's our new will. That's our new desires. It's pleasing Him. So if you got these people who go around and claim it, name it, because what it says right here in verse 14, ask anything and I can have it. Well, what you should be asking for is more strength, more power, more, you want to get closer to the Lord, give me more understanding, give me more knowledge. That's what we should be asking for. Not for material things. Right. That's not what Jesus did. I hope you all are understanding about this. Ask. It's not like what you see on TV where everybody's asking for houses and whatever. Verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. The fruit we want is to glorify the Father, the Lord. That's the fruit we want to glorify Him. So when we're asking for stuff, ask for the fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of There's a lot of fruits in there. Now we're going to learn... The fruit, what is, you're known by their fruit. So we're going we're gonna to learn what that is. But glorifying the Lord, that's what we should be asking for. What can I have to glorify you? To glorify you, not to glorify myself. Not to show people, oh, look at this nice fancy car I got now. Or look at this big old house I have. That doesn't glorify, glorify the Father. You're glorifying yourself. When he said much fruit, he was referring back to John 14:12. Where he says, greater works than these you'll do. That's what he's talking about. We're, we're going to do much. We're going to have much fruit. Like I said before, healing. Healing the sick. Casting out devils, demons. Telling the lost people about salvation. This is, this is our will. This is what we want to do. But he does show that they are not going to do it in the flesh. He shows you, if you're not in him and he is not in you, you cannot do it in the flesh. You can't do these things in the flesh. That's what we've been reading. Let's look at something here in uh, John 15. Some religions believe that you can lose your salvation. Well, right here, this is one of the verses they use about the branch being burnt 
But that they're thinking that branch is a Christian, which I just showed you. That doesn't mean they're this is for this is a lost branch. And so they use that with those verses to show that you can lose your salvation. But as we see, as we just seen the word of God, that's not that's not what that means. Isaiah five, verses one through seven. Now what I sing to my beloved, well beloved, a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. This is God speaking to his beloved and who is who is his beloved. We already know who his beloved is, but just in case you don't know, Matthew's chapter three verse seventeen says, And lo a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So he's speaking to his son Jesus, and we see that Jesus has a vineyard. Now back in John fifteen one it says Jesus is the true vine. And his and the father is the vine dresser. Verse two, and he fenced it, talking about the vineyard. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. O oh, now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem, and men of Judah, judge, I pray you between me and my vineyard what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have done not done to it wherefore when I looked that it should bring forth grapes brought it forth wild grapes and now go to I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard I will take away the hedge thereof and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof and it shall be trodden down we learn in the book of Job what the Lord did with Job. What the Lord had on Job. It says right here he's going to take, take the hedge away. The verses we just read. Because they weren't bringing forth fruit. He says I'm going to take the hedge away. And the hedge is talking about Job 110. It says has not thou made a hedge about him? Talk about Job. The devil saying didn't you put a hedge around him? And about his house and about all that he hath every, on every side. And thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But yeah, the Lord put a hedge around Job. Why? Because Job was a godly man. He was a righteous godly man. And this is the way the Lord took care of him. Israel, which he was speaking about here, Israel was not walking with the Lord. So he took the hedge away. Does that teach us anything? Believe me, we need, we want the hedge of God around us. But we can see right here, if you're not, if you're not producing fruit, if you're not walking with Him, He'll take that hedge away. And then you're on your own. And if something happens, the person who it happens to, what they're going to do? Blame God. People who don't know about His walk, well, why did God let that happen? See, we don't get the whole picture. We see a Christian brother and or sister and something happened to him. Right away you got Christians. Well, why did the Lord have let that happen to him or her? But right here it shows. If you're not walking with him. If you're not producing. He takes the hedge away. Now whose fault is that? God's? No, that's our fault. If we if we get out from underneath the umbrella that we're under. Is it our fault that, it, that we might get struck by lightning? It is our fault. Because we've gotten away from him. I just want to. We have a hedge. You want that hedge of God around you? Walk with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Verse 6. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is in the house of Israel. And the man of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment. But behold oppression for righteousness. But behold a cry. Father God said the vineyard belonged to his son Jesus. But now in these verses Father God is saying it's in the vineyard. First it was God. But now it's saying it's Jesus. It's just shown again that Jesus is God. I just wanted to point that out. But here in the Old Testament the vine is Israel. The nation. This is what the vine is. The vine is Israel the nation. Now don't get confused. The vineyard is the nation of Israel, not the individual people. It's just like Americans. 
well, Americans, they, they're, they're, they're lost. They want to take God out of this. And but you can't say America's lost because there's individuals like us that are true believers that do believe in God. And this is, this is what I'm trying to show in Israel. Israel as a nation was away from the God, but you had Jews who did walk with the Lord. So it's telling Israel is the vineyard. Not the people, not the individuals, but there's the people of Israel as a whole was away from the Lord. The Lord came to his vineyard expecting to find good grapes, but instead he found wild grapes. And we know what that is. Lost people, people doing just just away from the Lord. Acting wild, which that's what lost people do most of the time is they just act wild. Israel, the nation was planted here to produce fruit, but they didn't. That's what God put them there for. He said, this is my people. Not because they were better than any other nationality, but he chose them. But they felt they did not produce the fruit. Grapevine is only good for one thing, and that's to produce fruit. If it doesn't produce fruit, what is it good for? Ezekiel chapter 15, it talks about that, if you want to read about that. Oh, I'm not going to read that whole thing, but Ezekiel 15 will tell you about producing fruit. What you know? What's what's it good for? Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21 through 22. Yet I have planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? If you read above he's speaking to Israel again the nation he's talking about Israel the nation he's not talking about Abraham you know there these were all godly men there were Jews there were they were in Israel but he's talking to Israel as a nation he says I have put you there to be of my holy people how did you grow to be so corrupt he's saying why are you this corrupt vine I put you there as a, to produce but you're corrupt verse 22 for though thou wash thee with nitrate, and take thee much soap, yet thy iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. Even though you washed yourself, is what he's saying, with a lot of soap, you're still dirty. Is what he's saying. You're still dirty. You haven't washed. You haven't washed yourself with the words of God. That's what. That's what he was wanting them washed with. But they they were washing, but they weren't washing themselves with the word of God. And he said, you're still dirty. They didn't hear him when he said in Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So when you wash yourself with the word of God, the Lord says you're as white as snow. Amen? Amen. White as snow. But if you don't use the words to wash yourself, then you're still dirty. Another place that shows they didn't produce fruit for the Lord was Hosanna, Hosanna 10 1. Israel is an empty vine. An empty vine. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitudes, his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made godly images, goodly images. Israel is producing no fruit. I just want to show you again. Israel is producing no fruit. The fruit they have is unto themselves, he says. Unto themselves. They make altars to themselves. Because of them, they made things to be godly, but not of God. Yeah. Let me put it this way. They made things religious. Everything's religious. They made things religiously to be good, to, to seem good, but it wasn't from the Lord. Which we see that all the time. That's nothing new. It's still today. They were worshiping idols. Worshiping idols. And it, these religious leaders, they made it seem like it was good, but it wasn't. Just like the statues, just like people who pray to these statues, all these different statues they have. People pray to them. The Lord says that is wasteful, it is sin. It is not of God. We read in Romans because of their fallen, because of, because of Israel, the nation, failed on doing what God wanted them to do. It says in Romans 11 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Was their fall a fall where they couldn't repent and recover? That's what the Lord is saying. Their fall, was it a fall where they couldn't repent, re, repent and recover? 
And he says, no, of course not. All they had to do was repent. And they could have re recovered from their fall. And just like us today, when we sin, we fall down. What do we do? We get back up and say, Lord, forgive me. From the heart, forgive me. And what do we do? We start again. But some Christians, they fall down. And right away, the devil comes in and says, oh, you can't go back to the Lord. Not after what you did. You hear me? And they listen to him. Again, give them victory to the devil because they don't know any better. Because they don't read the word of God. God says, we're going to fall. We're going to sin. That's what sin is, is falling. But get back up. Come to me for forgiveness. I'll forgive you and forget it. And start again. But Israel didn't do that. They could have, but they didn't. Because of their disobedience, now salvation has come to us. <laughs> I mean... Somehow, some way, they would it would have gotten to us anyway. I think, but I'm not gonna say. Well, I'm glad Israel fell. <laughs> I'm glad they were disobedient. I'm not gonna say that, but because of that, yeah. now it says we can have this salvation. Amen. It says through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, and that's us. Yeah. We're seeing that they're worthless. The nation, as a whole, is a worthless nation. It produced no fruit. God said it was empty. Also, let me show you that back in John 15, some say that the fruit is speaking about leading people to the Lord. That's what they think, that's what they're saying the fruit is, is leading people to the Lord. You got religions who say that. If, if that's what it means, then what they're saying is if you don't lead people to the Lord, you lose your salvation. So what's that? That falls under works. If you don't do this, you're going to lose your salvation. It's fallen under works. We, we know, we know that we're not saved by works. Our works come after we get saved. Then we have works. You might ask, well, then what's it mean? Because that's what it sounds like. That's what it does sound like if you go back and read it. What they're saying is, God, well, let me see. I know. I, let me read this verse. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this very thing, that he, which is talking about the Lord here, that he which hath begun a good work in you, Jesus has begun a good work in us, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, will, be, will perform, will be with us until Jesus returns. That's what it's saying. People who say you can lose your salvation are saying from this verse that no, Jesus cannot finish what he started. That's what they're saying. Because right here it says, be confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you. Jesus has, has started a good work in me. Mm -hmm. We'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We'll, we'll perform it until he comes back. That's what this verse is saying. Where you have people who say, no, you can lose your salvation. That no, Jesus can't hold you until he comes back. That's what they're saying. They're going totally against the verse. Psalms 138.8 The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thy own hands. The Lord has the hands to do it. I mean, plainly. We know that. But people, I mean, that, that's, I mean how can people say this? Yeah. I mean, God right here is saying Jesus <coughs> can hold you until, the, until he comes again. Yeah. He can. He will. But these people are saying, no, he can't. They have many interpretations on John chapter 15. And through this teaching, I believe the Lord is going to show us exactly what chapter 15 is talking about. Yet, I've already gave you several interpretations of what religions think about John 15. But through this teaching, we're going to, the Lord is going to show us exactly what John 15 means. Through this teaching, because he's, he's, he's blessed me with the scriptures to give to y'all to show you exactly what John 15 means. In his words, not in my words, not in the religious man's words. He's going to show us in his words what that chapter means. You know, I tell people that all the time, but I've never, never had anybody ask me, Oh, what's the fruit? I mean, it seems like they would ask me that. You're known by their fruit. Well, Jesse, what's the fruit? Nobody's ever said that to me. <laughs> they just, I say that and they're like, they don't say anything. Well, I mean, wouldn't that, shouldn't that be an, uh, a question? 
But Jesse, you know by the fruits. That's what you said. Well, what is the fruit? 